Welcome, my name is Rachel Frick. I'm the Executive Director of the Research Library Partnership within OCLC Research, and I'm here to MC our research update today, so let's get started. As you may have heard while you're here at ALA, OCLC is celebrating a its 50th anniversary, but OCLC Research is also celebrating an anniversary of being around in OCLC for 40 years. So we've been spending our time, what we like to say, scaling and accelerating library learning and innovation. And I think um, as you approach middle age, you might be looking back as often as you're looking forward. And within research, we're really looking at the efforts that we've invested in over the 40 years and thinking about how it informs what we do going forward. And in, in that process, we're looking through um, a number of the research reports, or what we would say iconic reports that we've published, especially in the last 10 years, as well as publishing new research. And here's just a few of the items that are coming here. So we are publishing a second edition of Shifting Gears, and that report really focused on digitization of special collections. And we're using that report to actually think about how far have we come in 10 years? And you'd be surprised that maybe it's not as far as we'd wish to. And then to examine the challenges and the obstacles that are holding us back. So we're using that to frame conversations when we meet together at meetings like SAA, RBMS, and then a meeting that we're gonna be having in the fall, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. We published a, a first in the series called Realities of Research Data Management, um, and that is research being led by Rebecca Bryant, Brian Lavoie, and Constance Mappas, as well as de Demystifying IT, which is part of a long-running series within um, the Research Library Partnership around understanding the, the relationships between a central IT unit and digital archivists. And of course, advancing the national digital platform, which was focusing on digitization efforts within the public library, looking at it from a national perspective. We will have some upcoming reports at the end of July focusing on web archiving metadata, so look out for those as well. I'm really excited about this effort. We hired Chayla Weber as an um, external consultant to think, help us think about a research and learning agenda for special collections and archives. And what I mean by that, once again, it's that kind of looking back, looking forward. What do we know? What's holding us back? And where do we need to learn a little bit more in order to move us forward? So for us, it's setting up not only a research agenda so we can coordinate and broadcast where we're going to do our inquiry work, but also set up some learning opportunities for the communities we serve. Right now, we have a draft document that we're circulating. Um, we held a focus group at RBMS just last week. We're gonna do another focus group at SAA, and then we'll have a final draft for comment and conversation at our meeting on um, the RLP regional meeting on November 1st. For more information about this particular project, you can click on the link you see there. How many people have read parts of the digital um, visitors and residents research that Lynn Conaway has done over the last year? Great. Well, she'll be continuing to work along this vein, and she'll be coming out with uh, a newer report along this in, I want to say, towards the end of July, beginning of August, called The Many Faces of Digital Visitors and Residents, Facets of Online Engagement. So, and this report will be based on findings on her work that she's done with institutions not only in the US, but also UK, Spain, Italy, and Hong Kong. And there'll be more soon at that um, URL you see at the very bottom, oc.lc slash many faces. I always like to see it's great when organizations lead by example. We talk a lot about collaboration. OCLC is actually collaborating with two organizations on two separate research efforts. The first one is partnering with Ethica SNR on a Mellon funded study about um, investigating what happens when libraries differentiate themselves, not on the size of their budgets or their collections, but, but, but about the services they provide and what are the models of success? So we're hoping that this research actually underscores a lot of conversations going forward, and we look forward to the results of that towards the end of this year, beginning of 2018. That's being led by Constance Malpas at OCLC and Roger Schoenfeld at Ithaca SNR. And there's a great blog post um, by the uh, Inside Higher Ed that I would reference for y'all to find out more. We're also working with Lieber to do a research study around persistent identifiers and the role in the research information management landscape. 
And um, although that might seem like a bunch of researchy like terms, what I like about this effort being led by Rebecca Bryant um, and working with Annette Dortmund and Constance Malpas is that it really helps us figure out what we need to do, where we need to invest our time, and a little bit of sense making of, of personal and institutional identifiers and why they're important. Uh, they'll be presenting on this research at the Libra conference next month with a report coming out soon. And if you want to learn more, here I like to say stay connected. You can find out and subscribe to our Hanging Together blog. You can look at our Works in Progress webinar, which we actually talk to our partners and members and have them talk about the work that they're doing. You can find us on Facebook as well as follow us on Twitter. So here's just a list of some of the upcoming events here. We have our pop-up session at SAA. We have Rebecca Bryant's gonna be at Libra, as I mentioned, in Greece. But I also wanna shout out that we're gonna have the America's Regional Council Conference. Um, it's in Baltimore, October 30th and 31st. And if you happen to register for the Research Library Partners Meeting, which is immediately following the ARC meeting, you'll get a discount registration code for ARC. So it's kind of like a a nice little deal you can come together. So today I just wanted to keep my comments short and to the point and really turn it over to the experts that we have here on the panel. And starting here, we have Monica Single-Jones. She's our Wikipedia in residence at OCLC. Sharon Streams, our director of Web Junction. They're gonna be talking about the work that we're doing around public libraries and Wikipedia. We'll have a short 20 minute presentation, have a couple questions, and then hand the podium over to Kenning Arlich, the Dean of Montana State University Library, and Jeff McStur, one of our senior software engineers at OCLC Research. And they're gonna talk a little bit about accurate IR, IR file download measurements. I know that's hard, but ramp is a lot easier to say. <laughs> so without any further delay, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Monica and Sharon. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so yeah, as Rachel said, I'm Sharon Streams. I'm director of the Web Junction program, and I'm going to share an update about an OCLC-led project that is called um, Wikipedia and Public Libraries Better Together. And it's a project to build bridges between pub US public libraries and Wikipedia. And just a quick check, do I have any public library folks in the room? Yay. All right. Good. <laughs> um, but uh, I did uh, last give an update about this at midwinter. At that time, um, we really hadn't uh, dug into the project yet, so I'm excited to talk to you on um, what we've done since then. And a big part of this early phase of the project has been uh, researching why public library staff are already engaged with, um, with Wikipedia and how that's serving their communities and their patrons. And thanks to funding from the Knight Foundation and a supplemental grant from the Wikimedia Foundation, we have been able to bring to OCLC uh, Monica Shengel Jones, our, our Wikipedian in residence, who will be with us for the duration of the project. So she's going to be my co-presenter today and share of some of what she's learned from scouting to the nation and talking to librarians who Wikipedia, and yes, we are making it a verb. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here and to share this uh, research that I've been doing with public librarians across the US. Um, and uh, my background is in qualitative and ethnographic research methods, so speaking to public library staff about what they've already been doing could not be more exciting, and we're publishing this series on the Web Junction uh, website. But let me tell you now just a couple of the really standout highlight stories of public library staff who are just truly heroes to me um, as a Wikipedian and as someone, as a lover of public libraries. So first, I want to take you down to El Paso, Texas, where Susan Barnum, who's an outreach librarian at the El Paso Public Library, um, in April received a reference request from a patron who worked at the local history museum. The patron was curious to get more information, reference materials about a neighborhood, a border neighborhood, Chihuahuita, um, that's an endangered neighborhood right in the center of the city and along the border there. Very historic and very important. Well, Susan did something interesting. She gathered all of the materials um, that her library had, but instead of maybe doing what other 
outreach and reference librarians might do when they're uh, answering a reference request. Susan created and edited the Wikipedia entry on the neighborhood and sent the link to the patron. So here you can have a look at the article and at the, the beautiful list of references and sources that she unearthed for this patron and that she shared on Wikipedia. Um, in her own words, why did she do this? It would have taken me just as much time to compile all of the references for this question into a Word document. But writing a Wikipedia article makes this information available to everyone. It has longevity, visibility. So her contribution of the materials extended the reach of her work. It also extended the reach of library materials. And for her, she says, it's important for me to contribute to a collective body of knowledge that's accessible to everyone. I see myself as a librarian on Wikipedia. So for an outreach librarian, this is a really interesting way to do outreach. Um, since she created the article in April, it's gotten almost 400 page views, which might be a little number in the internet world, but in the library land, that's a lot of patrons who would have gone up to her reference desk to ask for those materials. And she has a message that she told me to share with other public library staff or about, who are curious about what she did. It's worth remembering that your patrons are all online searching for information. As repositories of our local histories, public libraries are well positioned to contribute their unique collections. She hasn't done just this. Susan is a prolific editor, and she's also been involved in a wiki project related to raising the visibility of women and women's history on the internet. So she's, in her words, written articles about women who you cannot Google and created, made them visible on Wikipedia. She also finds archival images that she will upload and share to her articles, such as this striking public domain photograph of five women officers from the 18th century United States women's club movement. Prior to her efforts, this was not available easily on the open web, and now it is. Here's the story about Susan on our website, and I'll be telling you a few more in a minute. So as part of this project, we are collecting and featuring uh, stories like Susan's on the Web Junction website. It's under a series called Libraries Who Wikipedia. Um, we just published this one last week, and you can read the full interview with her uh, on the website. And now just a, a little bit telescoping back to talk about our project. Um, so it, last year, OCLC was one of five winners of the Knight Foundation's 2016 News Challenge um, to, on the round the question is how might libraries serve 21st century information needs? And this project was our response to that. And we ha based it on the premise that public libraries in Wikipedia T working together based on their shared mission of um, open and free access to world's knowledge uh, would do um, wonderful things together. This collaboration would be beneficial to both, but that collaboration is, um, it, there's, there's, uh, it's only fledgling uh, uh, versions of it right now, and it's really not, um, it's not being networked. Um, but we also recognize that uh, each uh, the, those who work in Wikipedia and those who work in public library would have a chance to learn about the cultural norms, the rules, um, the jargon that are unique to each of, the, each, each of them. So we know there would be some bridge building that would need to take place as well. So the project is really unfolding in three phases. And right now we're in the, in the phase of researching the inner workings of Wikipedia. Um, Monica is a great resource for that, but also connecting us to the network of editors who you know, really don't have any formal network. It's, it's, uh, so we, are, we need to kind of move through the network and learn about it as we go. We're also scanning for existing resources that um, have been created through um, various Wikipedia efforts um, to, that can be used to, to inform our training curriculum and towards our overall project goals. And then we're also building awareness about the opportunities that Wikipedia can bring um, to libraries. Um, and we're talking to both Wikipedians and librarians, listening and finding points of intersection and making that happen. It's great that we have a primo people person here to help us with that. <laughs> now, 
the good news. So in September, we're going to be offering a free online training program to up to 500 U.S. public library staff. Um, it's going to be a 10-week uh, program that's offered across six live sessions. It'll be hosted by Web Junction. We know all about online learning, so it's going to be awesome. After the training program, we're going to pay attention about how, the, how libraries may apply what they've learned into the library. That is something that's very important to us. We don't believe that really learning is, has not really occurred until it's been applied. So we want to follow those who, who try things out or, or um, try things that maybe other libraries have done in their own library and hear what the results were. We want to share all of that, both the curriculum and the experience of the libraries openly for everybody to learn from in the larger library field extending beyond the US, beyond public libraries. Thanks. I have to say, as a Wikipedian and an academic, I was so attracted to this project because of this shared, really shared mission and vision between Wikipedia, the, the vision and purpose of Wikipedia, which you can see here, and what public libraries do, and the scale that, that this project will take by training on Web Junction truly, I think, will have a, a deep impact. So now just to give you a couple more stories. I want to take you up to Pennsylvania, where in Glendale, we have Allison Frick, um, no relation to Rachel, but both doing great work in the library world, um, has hosted a one-hour information literacy session um, at her branch library. Now, everyone you know, knows information literacy, especially right now, is particularly important. And it's something that libraries have been doing you know, since libraries began. But now, there's new tools that you can use to, you, to talk about inquiry-based. How do we know what we know when we encounter it? And this is something that Allison did in a really interesting and practical way. She partnered with a um, Penn State librarian, and they, hosted, they host one-hour information literacy sessions that are available to anyone at the library at their last session, which took place in May. They had about 12 people, some older folks who had, you know, weren't really all that sure how to use a computer, and then there was a, a youth who were working on research papers. And so from the very beginning, they just started by saying, look, this is how you turn on a computer, and then this is how you find your web browser. And then they used Wikipedia as a guide to talk about really important issues like usernames, privacy, citations, tracking links back, asking questions about the internet, and had a real success. Um, she did also credit the success to the popularity of gummy worms, and so I wanted to be sure to mention that. But I also think that the, the way that she was using Wikipedia in a really thoughtful way um, what helped. Um, in her words, she said, our event was so positive, it gives, the, it gives our success something to leverage for hosting future events. I can show my head librarian these outcomes and say, look, patrons wanted this, they came, they stayed, let's do more. She also really valued um, Wikipedia for information literacy in a way that other research has shown to be, um, to have it be particularly useful. There's a recent report that came out um, sponsored by the Wiki Education Foundation, which guides higher ed instructors to use Wikipedia in course assignments. And in the survey done with the 600, um, no, was it 60 courses, 6,000 students who participated last fall. 96% of the instructors who participated in the program said that they found using Wikipedia was more valuable for teaching digital literacy than traditional assignments. Allison also found Wikipedia is a great way to guide patrons to free references. There's a new tool on Wikipedia where you can create a citation by just inserting an ISBN number. And that tool connects to WorldCat, where it pulls in all that data, generates the reference on Wikipedia. And then when the reader goes to the reference, and everyone knows this is what you tell people when they say, I want to use Wikipedia, go to the references. Um, they click on that link and it takes them to WorldCat where they can then see where they can check that book out from their local library. 
So it's a very, for Allison, this was a very useful way to guide people to free information, which she really likes to do. Now, the final story I want to tell you is down in Dallas, Texas, where Tiffany Bailey has uh, used Wikipedia to build out some important cross-organizational partnerships and host a big event around art and feminism, which is a Wikipedia-led um, movement to raise the visibility of women in the arts and serve as a corrective to systemic bias on Wikipedia, probably on the internet more largely, but particularly on Wikipedia. So. Tiffany Bailey um, started to organize this event last December. She was not an editor before, and neither really were the collaborators that she worked with. But they taught themselves what they needed to know. They looked up the kinds of women in the arts in Dallas who needed visibility on Wikipedia, and they pulled their resources that they had, and they hosted an all-day event. They also partnered um, with children's librarians to serve children's programming so that folks could come and it would be a family affair. Um, and it was a huge success in her words. She said, people came, they stayed, um, they said, I'm so happy the library is putting this on. I got to know patrons by their first names. It was clearly something that they wanted. And she's already making plans to host this event next March with the same institutions. Um, so those are examples of some of the uh, stories that we're uncovering, um, and uh, we've really, the takeaway is that public libraries are really already on the vanguard um, of bringing librarianship to Wikipedia, and it's really just uncovering them and connecting these folks together, because um, we are finding when we talked to one librarian, they were really unaware of any other library that was doing something similar and related to what we're doing. Um, but they're building partnerships, serving diverse communities in mediated spaces, addressing gaps in representation, making their collections available online, and connecting more internet users to library collections. So we're really optimistic that this project will be a, a catalyst to see more of this activity. So just quickly, I want to say about what's next. Um, as I mentioned, um, if for any of your colleagues or for you, um, we, are, we are actively encouraging you to take advantage of this training program that's coming up this fall. It's going to be collaborative. Um, it's going to be friendly. And we're really designing it with public libraries in mind. So even though we may be making you, availing ourselves of curriculum that have been created um, by other projects, everything is going to be adapted and customized for the library audience. So registration opens for this training program on July 19th, and uh, like I said, we want to get 500 people in there, so spread the word. And we're going to have a preview webinar also on July 19th where um, folks can learn more about uh, what this what this whole uh, topic is going to be to see if it's interesting to you. It's going to feature Tiffany Bailey of Dallas Public Library that Monica just told her story as a speaker. And she'll be describing how she went from someone who uh, had never edited Wikipedia before to now learning to edit, edit partnering with organizations, including you know, her, her fellow library organizations, and hosting events in the library. And uh, OK, we put uh, a survey on some of the chairs up front, and there's more in back. We'd love to have you fill out a survey. It doesn't matter if you're a public library or, or academic or whatever. Um, we, uh, it's just kind of tapping into your current perceptions and use of, of library. And that's going to really help us inform uh, the curriculum as we're doing the final shaping of it. And um, also, we have a monthly project update email that all are welcome to sign up for. We send out uh, this blast every month, and it will have featured the librarians who Wikipedia stories and other updates. There's a sign-up sheet of manual pen and pencil one here that Monica has. We'll have it in the back there. Um, or you can just go to, to uh, Web Junction and use the quick online form there. So. Um, Please, uh, I think we have a few minutes for a couple questions, if you have burning questions, before we move over to the next phase. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. We're going to switch gears a little bit now and go into uh, institutional repositories. <laughs> 
How many of your libraries uh, run institutional repositories? Excellent, great. Well, we all know that the, the real value of institutional repositories lies in the fact that they provide open access to scholarly content. And the expectation, the hope, is that that access will lead to new research. That is, um, uh, that, this, that this content uh, helps to generate. So we have always, though, as libraries, um, had a bit of a problem measuring use of institutional repositories and therefore being able to articulate their value proposition. So we have developed, uh, in response to that, a web service called RAMP, Repository Analytics and Metrics Portal. And this is, um, uh, this is the result of research that was funded by an IMLS grant, and the title of that grant is uh, Measuring Up, Assessing Accuracy of Reported Use and Impact of Digital Repositories, and that URL there will We'll give you the full proposal of as we wrote it in 2014. And this is a partnership between four institutions, Montana State University, OCLC Research, the Association of Research Libraries, and the University of New Mexico. So here's what we'll be talking about today. First, we are proposing a new reporting model, a different way of thinking about uh, w what people see and what they use when they come to institutional repositories. And then we're going to talk about the problems of existing methods of uh, analytics reporting tools. And then Jeff will do a demonstration of RAMP. And then we will talk uh, a little bit more about the potential of the data set that we're collecting through RAMP. So a new reporting model. Um, there are, we, we propose that there are three different types of files in an institutional repository. The first two, we would say, are pretty low value um, for the purposes of promoting research. The last one is uh, high value, and we're going actually from bottom to top here. So the first uh, set of files are what we call ancillary pages, and these are HTML pages that just provide general navigation, search results, and so forth within the repository. The second type is uh, item summary pages. This is the the launch page, the page that people see just before they click on that link to download the file. But the real high value content is not uh, non-HTML pages, the actual files themselves, the, the, the publications, the presentations, wh whatever it is that people are downloading. These we call citable content downloads and they tend to be um, file types mostly like PDFs, uh, but also presentation, uh, PowerPoint, uh, presentations, Word files, data sets, and so forth. And the fact that they are non-HTML files it w is what makes them particularly difficult to, to count accurately. And I would just say briefly, we have discovered in our research that uh, something like 90% of academic libraries use Google Analytics uh, to measure use of their IRs. And what we have determined is that if uh, a library is using Google Analytics, then they are severely undercounting the use of their IRs specifically for this reason, because Google Analytics is great at, at counting page views of HTML pages, not so great at counting file downloads. So just to give you an example of what each of these pages look like, this is the institutional repository at Montana State University. This is the splash page. This is what we would call an ancillary page, right? Um, this is a set of search results from within the repository. This would also be an ancillary page, low value. This is an example of an item summary page. It provides the abstract, the title, a little bit of metadata, and most importantly, that link to the file itself, to the citable content download itself. And one would hope that when people cite research in their, in their own research, that they're not stopping at this page, right? That they're not just reading the abstract and then citing the article. We, the expectation is that people actually download the full file and then um, uh, conduct their research or, or generate their research from that. So current reporting methods. There are basically two classes of web analytics that most of us use. Um, the first is what can be called a page tagging service, analytics service. This is generally a software as a service 
Google Analytics falls into this category. There's no local installation. Um, it simply relies on a, page, a JavaScript page tag that's inserted into every HTML page on the repository. Okay? If somebody comes along and views that page, the JavaScript beacon sends a signal to up to the server, the Google Analytics server or the Web Trends server, and that's recorded as a page view. Does that very well for HTML pages. The other uh, type of web analytics is uh, log file analysis. And so these would be locally installed, usually, uh, 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 analysis packages, software packages that analyze server logs. And there are some IR platforms like DSpace and ePrints that have um, uh, log file analysis software built in. The big problem with log file analysis it is, is it is heavily polluted by robot traffic. There is literature out there that says that up to 85% of all traffic to institutional repositories is non-human traffic. And you don't want to count that, right? You, because that's, that's not the audience we're trying to reach. Back to the issue of Google Analytics and why it can't count file downloads very well, you, you have all gone to Google Scholar, right, and done a search and brought up a result like this. And then you have most likely clicked on that link to the right that's very convenient, the PDF link, and that routes you directly to the PDF download. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that you've just completely bypassed any of the JavaScript beacon code that's on the HTML page, the item summary page. So this is why Google Analytics can't count the file download very well. Same thing if you're on Twitter, you know, you get a link to an article, it sends you directly to the PDF. Facebook, email, whatever. Whatever the, the, the link is that sends you directly to the PDF, it completely bypasses Google Analytics. So this is why we say that Google Analytics severely undercounts. So Google Analytics and other page tagging uh, reporting tools do not track non-HTML citable content downloads. However, Google Search Console does. Google Search Console is a, a very powerful tool that typically helps webmasters diagnose the problems that crawlers are having when they come to your website. But it also does a very good job of counting direct file downloads. So we developed this method. We published a paper in October uh, called Undercounting File Downloads from Institutional Repositories. We did some research and gathered a data set to support our uh, findings. We looked at four IRs uh, over uh, a period of 134 days in the spring semester of 2016. Three of those IRs uh, were DSpace platforms. One was a content DM platform. What we found in that research is that most activity to institutional repositories is actually citable content downloads. And most of that activity is therefore unreported by Google Analytics. When you look at some numbers a little more specifically, this slide compares ancillary and item summary page views counted by Google Analytics with the citable content downloads that we were able to discover through Google Search Console. So these first two columns show you what Google Analytics was able to report from each of those IRs item summary page views and the ancillary page views. The third column just totals the first two. But look at the number comparison of what we were able to show over on the right with Google Search Console. So the far right column, uh, citable content downloads, look at all of those file downloads that were completely missed by Google Analytics. And I will say that the, the one column to the left, download events, there is a way to count file downloads in Google Analytics, but it's only if it's turned on, and you can see here for two of the four repositories it was not turned on, and very importantly, it's only if a user is already in the repository. So if download events is turned on in Google Analytics and your user has navigated through your repository, gotten to the item summary page, and then clicked on the file download link, then they will be counted. But as you can see from these two columns, the download events column is tiny compared to the direct 
file downloads that are coming from external sources and that we were able to capture with Google Search Console. So just to total that up, uh, that, that resulted in over that 134 day period that was 563,000 downloads that we were able to find that were not being reported by Google Analytics. And that is a 2,000% uh, increase in, in tracking improvement. So there are some challenges with the method that we developed. First, Google Search Console is a, guess what, Google product, right? So it only counts uh, direct links coming from Google properties. However, we have determined that that is the vast majority of the traffic coming to institutional repositories. There are other sources like Yahoo, Bing, email, Facebook, Twitter that are not being counted with this method yet, but they are a fraction of the traffic that is coming to institutional repositories. So we're pretty confident we're getting most of it. The other limitation is that Google Search Console limits time and access. It's a 90-day sliding window to the, to the data that it collects. And because of that, so, so, sorry, another limitation is that we had to do uh, programming um, to gather this data. And because of these limitations, we developed uh, RAMP. And Jeff is going to take you through and show you what RAMP looks like. Thanks, Kenny. So just to go over sort of the, the, the pertinence uh, about RAMP, um, it is a, uh, a cloud-based web service. Um, and uh, consequently, there is no installation required uh, for participating organizations. Um, there is extremely minimal training and configuration required. Uh, in fact, there, I would argue there's no training. Um, and the configuration is simply um, providing us um, some information about your IR, um, a couple of URLs, um, and that's, that's basically it. We can get everything plugged in and working from there. Um, in terms of actually using RAMP, um, it does provide a, a consistent method and terminology for tracking and, and um, uh, reviewing analytics. Uh, and because of that, um, this allows all of the organizations that are participating in the pilot uh, to benchmark not only across time, but also across organizations. Um, and I think this is really important um, uh, going back to what Kenny said about the different, uh, different type of log file analysis that are used by different types of institutional repositories. Um, you know, one of the problems is if this repository is using you know, the most up-to-date robots uh, file uh, detection and this IR is not, um, it's very difficult to compare um, organization to organization. It's basically apples to oranges here. So um, the most important part, uh, accessing RAMP, um, there is a URL here um, that will take you to the landing page. Um, it can be accessed by anyone. Um, it provides uh, links to all of the related publications associated with the grant. Um, and I'm sure it's difficult to see uh, way in the back, um, but towards the bottom is a very, very distinct blue button um, where you can access uh, RAMP. Um, and as soon as you click on that, you will be prompted for an organizational ID code or a password, if you will. Um, so at that point, um, what you need to do is um, email me, um, and then I need to eventually email you back. Um, and at that point, uh, we can give you access either just as um, a, a demo user, if you wanted to just take a look to see how it works, um, or hopefully, more importantly, um, uh, to actually sign up, uh, we can give you a walkthrough, uh, and again, hook, get, uh, get organizations hooked up in, in, a, in a matter of days. So um, uh, some more uh, facts about uh, RAMP. Um, as of uh, June 20th, we currently have uh, 12 um, IRs logging through RAMP um, from 10 organizations. We're currently tracking um, somewhere around, um, probably a little bit higher than this now, uh, 250,000 uh, digital items. Um, and we are capturing, on average, uh, 14,000 uh, citable content downloads per day uh, that, as Kenny mentioned, were previously um, not being reported. And uh, we currently support uh, four types of institutional repositories, um, though um, that's certainly um, expandable. These are just the ones we've been working with. Um, and those are uh, DSpace, uh, BPress, ContentDM, and Fedora. Um, so basically, if an organization is using any of those, um, again, it's just sort of give us the information, make sure you guys have uh, Google Search Console set up, and we can get you hooked up in, uh, like I said, a matter of, uh, matter of days. 
So um, from this sort of uh, uh, organization landing page, uh, once you've logged in, um, anyone, uh, any user can click on any of the different organizations to take a look at their data. Um, and once you click on an individual organization, uh, you get taken to sort of a, uh, you know, a, a dashboard type of statistics page um, that's divided into uh, two categories. Uh, the first is the daily statistics, where um, you, you know, have a nice little, uh, uh, the ubiquitous uh, calendar picker here. Um, you can select your day um, and then visualize the data in a couple of ways. Uh, the first here is um, access by device type, whether it be mobile, uh, tablet, or uh, traditional desktop. Uh, you can take a look at a, a click comparison across all the participating organizations uh, for that specific day. And uh, the th last tab here um, is a basically a download all the data from that respective day. Um, it downloads it as a TSV so you can open it up in your spreadsheet application of choice. Um, and just to take a quick look at the data, um, I did actually, what I wanted to point out here is we are logging uh, in, in our uh, back, in the back end index both citable content link, citable content download links as well as non citable content download links. Um, and, and Kenny's going to talk about this uh, later on. We think this data is really important. Um, so as we start working and, and running uh, analysis across all of this uh, you know, big data, uh, we can actually start to do uh, diagnostics as to what's being used, HTML, not HTML, is a landing page getting hammered, uh, things like that. Um, and then uh, these other columns are just sort of, um, again, sort of uh, ubiquitous stuff, the country of origin. Um, and I do want to mention that, um, and this is very important, uh, we are not collecting any personally identifiable information at all. Um, so Google Search Council actually doesn't provide us with any. Um, so we consequently don't have any. Um, so I mean, one, of the, um, one of the concerns we've heard about um, you know, people, organizations being able to access other organizations' data is this issue of privacy. Um, but like I said, that's, uh, that's simply not a concern uh, given the data we're actually working with. So the second set of the dashboard uh, is sort of this uh, cumulative statistics. Um, and this is dynamic, so as soon as you click on the organization, this just starts loading. Um, this is uh, sort of just the first uh, visualization is just a histogram over time uh, of downloads per day. Um, the second is a, um, a map of where clicks are coming from. Uh, that's why I talked about the, uh, the country of origin earlier. Um, this is really interesting. Actually, one of the participating organizations, the University of New Mexico, um, identified that they're having a lot of traffic from Ecuador. Um, so the IR manager, John Wheeler, sort of dug into, you know, what, why, why is this? They actually had more traffic coming from Ecuador than from the United States. Uh, which was uh, a very odd, um, and he found out it had to do with some collection they had in their IR um, is, is heavily used by uh, so, some university in Ecuador. So it was just, um, it, it was really interesting to uncover that. Uh, and then the final section, um, again, this is where a little uh, configuration stuff might happen, uh, is if you're logged in and authorized, if you go to your own institutional repository page, um, you can do some minor uh, configuration changes. So you can add uh, additional URLs um, if you wanted to add another IR, for example. Um, and you can also uh, turn off uh, daily login. So um, at that point, I'm going to turn it over, back over to Kenny for the wrap up. So you may have noticed that one of the unique things about RAMP is that we are creating a single large data set. RAMP is not individually installed at every uh, institutional repository. It is a single cloud-based um, instance. Uh, institutions uh, register with it, and as a consequence, we are collecting a large data set. Um, we have been collecting data since January 1. Any institution that joined uh, by the end of March, we will have data for them back to January 1 because of that 90-day sliding window. So the, the really cool thing about that, collecting that single data set, is that we can start to do some interesting research in the future with it. Some, some, um, and one right off the top easy thing is a, a diagnosis of how the IR is performing. If you look at this chart that, that Jeff showed earlier, You'll notice that there are a couple of repositories where there's none or almost no uh, reported citable content downloads. Now, one of these we know was because they had just gotten on board and hadn't started tracking yet, but the other has been with us since January 1, and 
there's clearly some performance problem here, and it's most likely an SEO problem, search engine optimization problem, um, that can be diagnosed and fixed. So that's one easy right off the top benefit of RAMP. But as we collect this data set, we think that we can do a lot more with it. You may have noticed in the table that Jeff showed you of the data that we are collecting that there is a URL for every, or a handle for every article that was downloaded. Again, we don't know anything about who downloaded them, but we just know that this article was searched for and downloaded, or at least searched for, not necessarily downloaded if it wasn't found. But because we have that handle, that means that we can go, we can do some data mining, right? We can, we can go connect to the APIs of each of these repositories and gather metadata about each one of those articles. And that then starts to create a very rich data set for us. We can reconcile those key entry fields so that we can normalize data. As we well know, because there are so many institutional repositories, everybody does things a little bit differently with their metadata. And so until we normalize the data, you can't really do very good analysis across it. But by connecting with vocabularies like uh, LCSH and VIAF and FAST, we can start to normalize that data. So once we have a normalized data set, uh, then we can start to do some significant evaluation of the scholarly record across IR and across the nation. So we can review what's there. What, what, what kind of material tends to end up in, in institutional repositories? What's the gap between what people are searching for and what they're finding? If there are universities who specialize in a particular kind of research and yet that research isn't represented in their IR, that's a serious gap that they could fill. Um, and then how visible are these items in search engine results pages? We can tell, do they float to the top of a search engine result page? Are they down on page 100? And then you know, the holy grail that we all want to know, do IRs really have a positive effect on citation, uh, uh, the number of times uh, research is cited? How long does that take? How many citations? Does that influence the university's reputation and ranking? So you can see what we're, what we're starting to get into here. We have some future development that we want to do of RAMP. Uh, we want to add even more reporting and analysis capability aside from the visualization and, and statistics that Jeff has already added to it. Um, benchmark comparison across repositories. We do want to fill that little gap of non-Google sources. So we want to add the capability to, to uh, capture those downloads from Bing, Yahoo, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. This is our development team, our RAMP development team. These are a uh, couple of the publications. I also already mentioned the first one, Undercounting File Downloads. The article about RAMP uh, appeared in Library High Tech in March. And then, once again, the proposal at the bottom. And then I'd just like to remind you if you want to see this presentation again or you want your colleagues to see this presentation again, we will be doing a works in progress webinar for OCLC um, on July 6th. So thank you very much for listening.